Hello everyone and welcome to um, today's lecture by Dr. Chow Swo from Monash University. Chow will be talking about structural MRI and how you will be able to analyze some of your data on the Characterization Virtual Laboratory, which is also known as the CVL. Um, and he'll be giving you a few instructions and um, also a little bit of background as to these types of analysis that you might like to do and, and why you might like to do it. Before um, I hand over to Chow to get going, um, we, I wanted to let you know that we will be having a follow-up workshop for this event. And for that event, you will need to have your own access to CVL in order to participate and follow along and do the steps. So I'm going to give you a little quick presentation now, um, just for five minutes about what CVL is, what it could offer to you and how you might um, start to set yourself up with an account. So I'm going to share my screen now. There we go, share and present that. Okay, now when I present these talks, sometimes I like to do them in something called Minty, which is a little bit interactive. If you guys want to go to this link um, on your phones or whatever, towards the end, I'll be asking a question and you'll be able to um, participate live in the, um, in that question and quiz and we'll be able to have a look at, at what you say in response to the question. It's not an exam so don't worry about it, it's not, it's not that type of question. Um, so as I said, um, today's session is about um, working with your SR, SMRI data within the CVL itself. So if you're in the wrong one, you can leave now, um, but hopefully this is the information you have come to find out. Um, just down the bottom of this slide, I'll point out that there's a web address called imagingtools.org.au. Now, that is the website which has um, been started by the project that I work on uh, with Chow, which is the Australian Characterization Commons at Scale project. And we participate in that project, which is funded by the AIGC. And we have a website here, imagingtools.org.au. And if you go to it, you might be able to find um, more information about events. And also, um, we're increasingly putting more and more information on about the tools and services that we offer, such as CVL. So um, here is a gratuitous link here. I'll put it up again at the end. You can also get this link um, by going to the website Imaging Tools. But this is a link for you to join up to attend the follow-up work workshop that Chow will be giving next week, same time, um, Thursday next week. So I'll just give you a second to write that down if you wanted to, or, but as I said, you can go to it from Imaging Tools. And there is a form to fill in there. You will need to register separately for their, that event. Your registration for today won't cover you for, for this second workshop event. And it would be good if we could know ahead of time so that if there are any issues with setting you up with your um, CVL account, we can get them smoothed over for you ahead of time. Okay, so here's me giving you a brief introduction to CVL. As I said, I'm Catherine. I work with the National Imaging Facility. I'm based in Brisbane. Um, and so I interact more with one of the other nodes of CVL than the one that, that Chow will be introducing you to today. But I work across all of them and that's a good point for you all to know, which is that no matter where around the country you may be, um, you can always interact with uh, a CVL node for your data. So today I'm gonna just very quickly tell you what CVL is and um, recommend to you very strongly why you should engage with it. The main reason is, and uh, to steal my own thunder, it's free. So that I think is the uh, is an excellent reason for you to, to get on board with it. Um, I'll give you some instructions as to where you can get information about how to access the CVL service, and then um, what you can do to help you learn more about completing analyses once you've got an account. Okay, so without too much more fussing around, this is sometimes how I think people feel when they start to enter into neuroscience or any of the characterization science spaces, it looks pretty overwhelming. You get a whole heap of data and you think, I have absolutely no idea how I'm gonna to get to the other end. I've got a thousand files and it, someone says to use this program, someone says that program, they say set this parameter this way or that way. And you think, I'm never gonna make it through this maze. Well, that is the whole purpose of the Australian Characterization Commons at Scale project. 
our aim is to create an ecosystem for youth researchers um, to help you navigate your way through that maze. And we offer a number of services. We don't offer instruments, but we partner with organisations that do offer access to instrumentation. And we help you to find the tools and um, resources that you need to get your analysis done. So just as a quick description of this little ecosystem, you might be working on an instrument. Now, as I said, I work at the National Imaging Facility and we have a, a large number of instruments. You may actually be completing your um, scans and that sort of thing on, on instruments that are in part National um, Imaging Facility infrastructure. So you might be gathering your information of an instrument, which may or may not have a PID. And, and hopefully it does if it's a NIF machine, uh, a persistent identifier, then you can gather your metadata about your actual data acquisition um, from the point of, of commencing your project then, and that can go with you. And so your data can then go through services like XNAT, um, it's probably the main one that, that you would be engaging with, into a data repository. And then from that data repository, you may then want to analyze your data in some sort of way. And so we then offer you access to platforms where you may be able to complete some of your analysis. And the main one that um, we offer mostly is the CVL. But we also, um, within the CVL itself, um, allow you to have access to um, verified and um, centralised databases like the Human Connectome Project. So um, reference collections that you may want to compare your data against for some reason like that. So if you engage with the CVL, those data would be made available to you um, in a de-identified way that you could then um, use to enrich your project. The main thing about the platforms that we offer is that um, they're most often, although not always, you can use a desktop um, a situation, but usually you can access it using your web browser, which is the most easy and convenient way for most users, which means that no matter where you are, you can um, do your analysis. Um, so for instance, you may have booked some time on a machine, um, maybe three hours, you've done what you need to do in, in that time, your session has ended and your data is on that machine, you've then sent it to your primary repository, but you don't have the computer. So the beauty of using a, a centralized platform is that you can then use your web browser from home or back in your office to then access those data and analyze them um, from within that platform at your convenience. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is because it will be a high performance computing environment where you will then be able to do that analysis. So you'll be able to utilize all the power of a high, an HPC rather than relying on using your laptop, um, the grunt of your laptop to, to do the work. So you can uh, outsource that computing. And the other advantage to it is that the software that you can use on the platform is pre-configured and uh, there will be, I'm going to say low code, not no code, but low code. So there are some interfaces that you can use to um, select options and, and do things like a, a sort of Windows feeling environment, but you're actually um, working on the, on, in a Linux environment. And um, once you've done that, you can then export all of your data into um, another repository, back in the first one, maybe the same location, but it will now be your derived data set. And it will then be packaged up nicely with all of that metadata coming with it, the information about the analysis that you've done, you can download um, logs and that sort of information to store with it as well. And you may then want to put that into uh, a secondary repository like um, Zenodo or OSF or whatever your publisher may require when you go to publish your results. Um, and then you can also add those data into something like Research Data Australia, where they can become indexed for other researchers to find and engage with. So by going through this ecosystem, you're engaging with all of the FAIR principles in making your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and hopefully reusable. And at the end of the day, that's one of the most important things. These data have cost you a lot of time, money, blood, sweat, and tears to generate, and having them organized in a way that they will be there in perpetuity for other researchers to interact with and be able to trust that these data have been um, obtained in an ethical way and have been curated well and are, and are there and something that they can have confidence in as well is a wonderful thing and will stand you in, in good stead for being a respected and uh, reputed researcher. 
so that's the ecosystem. And um, I've gone over a lot about what CVL is. And basically CVL just stands for Characterization Virtual Laboratory. So um, I've, I've pretty much described it already to you, but it's a virtual space online. So you are using um, a web service or you can download a desktop client as well um, to access remote computing and um, using the power of the remote computer, but locally on your, um, across your web browser. You can find out more information about it by going to our Imaging Tools website at um, imagingtools.org.au slash CVL. So I've covered these pretty much already, but the main advantages as to why you would want to engage with CVL in the first place is firstly, it's free. So um, all of this HPC power is there for all researchers around Australia. Um, it's, as I said, uh, the major funder of our project is ARDC. So we are a platform provider and service provider. And anyone who has an AAF login, which will be most of you in, um, universities or everyone in the university and also some external research facilities like for instance um, um, oh, Walter and Eliza Hall we hi you, you will have access as well um, so major research institutions uh, and if you're not sure you can always go to the AA website and check if you are a member but um, you can also partner with a university that is a member if if you, if you are not an AAF subscriber, but you most likely are, and you've probably seen it when you go to log into your library, it'll say, um, use your AAF login. So it's free for anybody who has one of those logins, and it will give you access to large amounts of GPU processing remotely, and you will be able then to process huge amounts of imaging data very quickly and much more comfortably and easily without hearing the fan in your computer whirring ceaselessly and worrying that it's going to freeze um, and hopefully render your images a lot more quickly and flexibly for you. As I said, it works with Linux tools or Linux tools, depending on how you like to pronounce that, and they've all been pre-installed for you. You can't install your own packages directly onto the CVL. They are maintained by the um, project team and we have our own IT team that work on installing new packages for you but if there is one that is not there that you would like you can always write to us and engage with us and we will um, build a container for you to put that on there if it's feasible and we'll work with you to come up with a solution. Um, as I said it presents little user interfaces with drop down menus and that sort of thing so for people who are unfamiliar with coding it's a really good entry point for you to get started with using some Linux tools. And it is integrated with a lot of reference collections. As I mentioned, the Human Connect Time Project data. The other thing about it is it will allow your workflow then to become reproducible. So Chow will show you some steps that you can take to write a script so that, for instance, you may do one analysis one day and want to then come back and do a second lot of data acquisition and you want to analyze it in the exact same way. You can then reproduce that pipeline exactly. Um, this is just a quick slide on some of the sort of software tools that are offered on the CVL. And what's probably of most interest to you is the top line here, these MRI tools. Um, there's a lot more um, when you log on, you'll be able to see, but these are just some like 3D Slicer, FreeSurfer, FSL. Um, and also importantly here, you can see it's integrating the XNAP desktop to help you with moving your data and your metadata around. And there's also MR tricks and, and various other things. Um, as I said, there may be some software that, that is not here that you may want to use. So please do interact with, um, with us by either the Imaging Tools website or contacting Chow directly and we can, um, or me, and we can um, work with you about see, making sure that we've got you covered. Um, the CVL itself operates across three nodes around Australia. There's the node at Massive, which is uh, running on the M3 supercomputer. There's one in Western Australia um, at Pawsey. And then the third one at the University of Queensland, which is powered um, on the Wiener HPC. Um, all researchers in Australia have access to the CVL at M3, no matter where you are around the country. Um, similarly, access at UWA um, is coming online. This is our newest node. Um, and so there's still some work being done on launching that node. Um, but it should be coming online within the next week or so. Um, and then the Wiener node is available to researchers in Queensland.
or interstate partners of researchers in Queensland as well can also be collaborators and they may be able to access CVL at WENA. Um, so when you get started, I'm just going to show you briefly, there's two ways you can interact once you've got an account. There will be going to desktop.cvl.org.au and then what I wanted to point out is this here, there's the new Strudel Beta button up the top. Um, this is something that we've been trialing out, which will present you with a new interface for logging in. The main thing is that when you come, when you get in, this is what you'll be presented with, and you can choose from a number of pre-configured options as to the type of desktop you might be wanting to use. Um, you don't need to know too much about that at this stage, but the main thing is, you can understand here there's the k1 desktops which are being phased out um, but they are for if you want to do a batch submission maybe using just a command line um, or just visualizing some stuff that you've already analyzed so not really doing any major heavy analysis with this configuration then you might want to do some light computing perhaps you may have uploaded some things or something like that and you want to do some light computing you would use a p4 but if you've got a big job, um, then you can use the power of the K80 desktop there for that. Um, and then this is what the CVL itself looks like. As I said, there's three pre-configured options and you can see them there. There's the one that you would use for batch submission, which will only give you 13 gigs, uh, running up to the, the K80 configuration, which would, you would use for a heavy load. Um, and the other main thing I want to point out to you here is that you can only run one desktop at a time. Um, and so you can't be running under your login two desktops um, simultaneously. So you need to complete each session before you would start a new one. The jobs do go through a, um, a slow process that when they're being um, set up for you, these desktops are being run on the HPC for you. So you will go into a queuing system and it is a national service. So um, you are restricted to just one, one go at a time, unfortunately, but it's generally adequate for, for your needs. Um, and when you're working with the CVL, you have a number of options for how you might like to get your data in and out. The main one is um, SFTP is still uh, pretty good. You might use something like FileZilla or CyberDuck um, to do that. Um, but you can also use integrations with repositories, like XNAT, or maybe your institutional repository through something like TrueDat at University of Western Australia, or at, at the University of Queensland, we can interact directly with RDM or you could even just use cloud store um, for, from Rnet to store your data externally. Um, the main thing I wanna say about when you put your data into CVL is if you are using human data, which you obviously all will be doing, it must be de-identified before it can be mounted into the CVL. Um, the other thing that you might want to use if you have large amounts of data that you need to transfer quickly or share with your collaborators is the new Globus service. You can find out more about some of these services um, on our website, or you can write to us and we can give you some information about, information about how you would set these things up. Um, so just to cover again, if you'd like to participate in Chow's website um, workshop next week, you will need to have gained access to CVL at N3. And if you don't have an account, or you'd like to set up an account, even if you can't make it to the workshop, please get in contact with me and I will help you to set that up. And once you do, um, for those of you who may already have a CVL account, I would like you to join this project here, OH21. And this is what it looks like um, inside. And if you go to join existing projects, I'd like you to be a, a member of OH21 for the workshop sessions, please. So, here again is the link to participate in the workshop next week. Um, and you can also go to the imagingtools.org.au website to find the information there and you can register from, from that website. Chow, I'm just gonna have a quick check. Did anyone want to ask any questions about CVL before I move on? Um, it was just a quick overview. I think most of you are by this stage getting pretty familiar with CVL, but I just wanted to recap for any, um, new people to our group. Are there any questions there, Chuck? Uh, no question um, from the Q&A sessions or the chat. Good, good. Really, really good summary. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine.
<laughs> You're very welcome. So um, thanks everyone um, for listening to me talking about the CVL itself. I'm going to hand you over now to Chow and he's going to go through the, the meat of today's session, which will be all about the SMRI analysis. And um, yep. to get him started, I'm going to just ask a quick quiz question, please, which is why I, I asked, invited you to come to the Menti site. And uh, Catherine, before you go, there's still a, uh, there's a quick question from oh, Mark. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to put this question up and they can be working on that in the background and I'll see if I can answer oh, okay. the question. Yep. Yeah, what was the yeah. question? Uh, so will there be an upgrade to newer nodes? Um, will there be an upgrade to newer nodes? I guess that's the infrastructure upgrade. So yeah. or, or the, or the inc including new Oh yeah, I think I think there was some planning, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, each of the supercomputers is maintained by its own owner. So, for instance, um, Massive maintains M3, and they do constant upgrades and acquisitions of, of new bits of hardware that they then feed into M3. So new cards and that sort of thing are being added all the time. So as I was showing you there, the K1 desktops are, are being phased out. They're they're on older hardware. Um, and the K80s are now taking their role. And I, I see that they've actually, um, if you go to the Strudel 2 with the white tab, the Strudel Beta, um, you can now get some dual processor sessions going um, standard. So you can use um, two lots of GPU cores if, if you have need to, which is useful um, for some of our other um, stakeholders, I suppose, or, or clients, it would be that they, doing cryo EM, for instance, and they need to have two GPU sessions running concurrently, and you can avail yourself of those desktop configurations now um, from the Strudel beta site from, from that login point. Um, so yeah, they are being constantly upgraded. Um, at UQ, there are some, that commissioned some, some new hardware, and there is most likely to be another instance of CVL being rolled out onto that hardware in in the coming year or two um and so from time to time yeah new things come on board the uwa stuff is being run on pausey and it's being uh, it's it's live now and and coming more and still in a bit of a testing phase but um it will be pretty much good to go um definitely within the next month um and there's also often talk of um, other university partners wanting to set up their own CVL instances, perhaps one in New South Wales and potentially one in South Australia as well. Um, so the thing about the CVL is that it can be put onto any HPC um, using the basic CVL desktop itself. And then from there, you can add different packages or programs and, and personalize the space a little bit depending on what you need. But it is a national service, so people should be able to access any of the nodes and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So yes, yes. And, and I think that's one of the advantages too, is that this hardware is constantly being upgraded and acquired and, and hopefully rolling out better and better computing for you guys. I think they've answered your questions, Chow, here on um, what their previous experience with neuroimaging is. Um, one developer and, and a lot with um, an introductory sort of level. You know who is the developer now? <laughs> uh, okay, great. Uh, thank I'll, you. I'll answer the quiz and, and <laughs> obscure the results slightly for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. So I can um, continue. Um... I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, see the slides. So, um, so, so this, I was thinking this workshop or this presentation just slightly is a different type of presentation, at least for me, there's not a really academic way that we pre presenting It's not like a traditional way academic you, you you're talking about your hypothesis and the findings and then wrap up. So it would be more focused on practicals and uh, hands on. So actually the, the, the most important thing is a week later, the one that we can get everyone's on CVL and go through all of the tasks that are created, then we can go through it. Uh, but today, this is just um, like a preview uh, of what we're gonna go through for the next Thursdays. Um, and then a little bit background of everything. And then 
most important is the rational. And then I think after probably after this one and in the work, a workshop, if we focus on the hands-ons and the practice, I think one of the big rationale we'll do is this, this will give us a good way to, to show the advantage of the ecosystem that um, um, Catherine just talked about it. So, so that's, so that's what's the, where's the data and then the, the, the softwares. And then today I'm gonna to talk about the parallel computing uh, power, power behind it, how this one can boost all of our uh, daily works. Um, so I'm glad to see there's actually quite a few of the proportion of people is actually new to neural imaging's um, analysis field. So very importantly, the whole concept of ACCS, especially working package five is to getting um, more to, to help to, to, uh, to provide the support to neural imaging community. And especially for those new people and the stu students, researchers, and then they haven't using this before. And then we want to show you what is this, the, the product kind of a standard the ecosystem and then see whether they will inspire your research. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start with, oops. so this is our line or just roughly put it up. So we're gonna first talk about the rationale. So why, why we need um, the, the workshop today, why we need to talk about this today. Um, so I think first of the first, I believe for most of the researchers in neuroimaging um, field, we're not programmers. Um, that's drawing a lot of uh, uh, experience and memories when I see this this one. Um, so I do have a lot of things have to pick up and in a in a hard way. Um, and that's not only because of the ed education background, but also because the lack of documentation. So that's when you really want to do something and you find the documentation select and you get a script. And as everyone probably have this similar situation, they get a script and they you don't know where they run it and what does this one means and then you don't know where's the input output data and that's probably because of the people who was working on this project before and probably just because of ourselves uh, so this is just a, a common problems for everyone um, that's a reason too i was thinking the third one is a bit more general it's like a background so so how are we gonna to taking the advantage of this the cluster computing system. This, this is a powerful tool, platform and tools and also for CVL. Um, one thing from a neural imaging point of view is the sample size is getting more and more crazy these days. Um, so this recent papers uh, published recently is talking about all of this whole brain cross-section analysis need thousands of the brains. Um, and then that is what the power is needed. Um, and you can imagine that is not a, a simple work that you can do on your local computer, um, I would say. You need this powerful computing system, um, especially with the, the open data set is available here and there. I think very importantly, um, once the HCP data is available on, on CVO at um, uh, M3, Messi, so which means you just, once you get access, they just like a folders next to your folder and you can copy paste and doing analysis of your life. And, and another thing is for brain imaging, neural imaging analysis, most of us, this, we, the, the elements is a subject. So this gives us a very natural, independent way that we can parallel all of our computing tasks. So we just do participant by participants and put them separately. Um, and then of course, there's a trend of centralizing data uh, process on the cloud. So now we're talking about clouds, everything's on the cloud and centralized. Yeah, so we're working um, yeah, on the cloud, yeah, both academic and also commercials, all of these computing systems. Um, another things, what uh, Catherine just really have given a really good uh, illustration is the powers of CVL. So, Traditional with thinking when I'm using, I, I'm starting from my PhD um, using something like my local computer. Now I move to Monash and then get uh, explored by CVL. So it feels like you are users or researchers of your own, own computers. And then you, through internet, access to CVLs, which is a group of powerful nodes behind it. We call the visual nodes. And you have this desktop, and you can run stuff on there. And also, very important, they have 
thousands of more powerful things. Uh, it's called a working nodes, like workers behind it. And then you can actually use them as the power to do all of the parallel computing stuff. Okay, the challenge, now I'll come back to uh, a student's a researcher point of view, the challenge is always coming back into, um, well, there's so many scripts. When I got a script, there's everything. So most of, luckily, most of the scripts that in neural imaging field is bash script, like FSL, free server, et cetera. So we're kind of naturally working well with um, the, the, the Unix system or Linux system. Uh, some of them is in MATLAB, like the SPM is also, it's kind of a popular one. Uh, and then also the Python is a big community is growing very, very fast and uh, like the NiPy, but luckily Python and MATLAB don't have the weight to working on in the, in the Linux system. So that's, we can do that, but there's still, there's a lot of environments that for different codings of different type of work you want to do. And on top of that, another troublemakers is the Slurm. So when I starting it, we, in fact, in 2013, when we started, we used the PBS, this SBatch, oh, sorry, not, not SBatch, is QSub. And then I'll change to Slurm. I have to remember all the other type of different ways that to submit your work to this called a workload manager. And the workload manager will estimate it, what resource you need, and then push that into the workers to let it run. Okay. So I think today is the, the, the most focus I'm going to, need to talk about is just so with some of concrete tasks that we want to do, how do we conduct these, these typical pipelines on CVL? And especially how do we out, uh, submit to Slurm system yeah, to run and power, to, to, to utilize this Slurm system? And I'm, I'm going to, especially the workshop today, I will get some scripts that you can really copy and paste into terminal and get things running. And all of those scripts will be in the template and you can later change it easily to make it working on your works. So uh, I so last night as a coming to idea, so probably I'll take my talk as hopefully they will be used as a, a missing menu. So this is what I find is a lot of this in the talk is not been clearly uh, illustrated or maybe they're just from like the postdoc teaching, teaching the students and then the students pass to the junior student, et cetera. So maybe we just, Kind of get a little bit more system way to doing it. Um, especially we want to emphasize that this is work on CVL and how does this make the best work on CVL? Uh, of course, this is just a way that I'm using um, you know, for the CVL massive in our lab. So people have a different way to do it. To say, then they may I don't know who is better or who is worse. There is there's always uh, the way that suit for people. But happy to start with it and you can keep improving it. Um, Okay, so with quickly with still before we get up all of the hands on task, we just talking about the background. Um, um, and then also, let me see, because the time now it's one, the 1.40. Um, yeah, I'll estimate around the two o'clock, we can have a, a break for five minutes. And I think the whole things won't take two hours. It will just probably finish in um, at 2.30 ish. So that's the plan. Um, so the background we're going to cover into three parts mainly is the first, what is the ACCS and what's the uh, working package five and then the CVL. I think uh, Catherine already has a lot of um, brief introduction of the CVL um, and also basically just neuroimaging and then the structure, especially the T1 weighted image anchor we're going to uh, utilize it today. Um, that will be very brief. Um, and then we're going to three uh, typical uh, imaging process toolbox, so tools. So well, first one will be the free surfer, which is a very typical way we kept cortical thickness. And then the second one is FSL first, which is, this is one of the tools within the FSL family that just to get the subcortical uh, region segmented and measured. And third one is the MATLAB based, um, uh, typical way we do it is the MATLAB based uh, SPM 12, and then here in particular, we're using the uh, longitudinal VBM pipelines provided by CAT. Um, that's just a showing, I'm not saying this is very, the most, uh, the, the robust way to do the longitudinal pipeline, but it's just a way to showing how do you process some uh, parallel computing something if it's MATLAB based on task. Okay, so all of this uh, example pipelines, I was thinking we can talk about the introductions very briefly and then how do you visualize this? So all of these tools to providing the way that you can visualize the results. 
how we can interactive, I said interactive, so we can play with it, view it, and then check what's the input and output. I will put the folders into, so the, the materials on next week. So you can explore what is the, the good output it looks like, and you can check what is different files and folders, what does that means and how to visualize it. And then you can play with it, get beautiful pictures. Um, and then how do we run it? Just one person, so just one task we want to run. How do we do it in, yeah, in, in, in bash script, uh, sorry, in, in bash or in the terminal? I think this is coming into the naturally the idea is if you want to run something, I mean, at the beginning, you click the mouse and click the buttons to everything GUI. And then later you decide, oh, I'm just typing a little command that can be to run it. Um, and then slowly you will have to say, I'll have to repeat it, um, type in the command once and once again, then I will start to write a script. And then those, how do we have the, once we have the script, how do we use the slurm? The last thing is to send it to the, the workload manager, the slurm, and how to get things a parallel. We have uh, some light pros, um, task with a couple of participants. Hopefully on that day, we get everything run. And after that, you will see the structure is actually quite simple. And you can just change around and make it uh, work down your task. Um, so hopefully by the end of the day, um, probably today, hopefully, but most likely it will be next uh, Thursday, um, you will get a good understanding of it. Okay. Um, so for the background, um, this is quick introductions of what is the ACCS. Um, so I got this slide from uh, Fanush, which is the um, um, just the leading of the working package five in um, uh, in ACCS project. Um, yeah, if I say something wrong, she can correct for that. But my basically is the ACCS is a big uh, national wide project is organizing it by multiple universities and then the founding body, the government funding body is, yeah, just trying to create this, um, the uh, correct, correct systems and commons, yeah. Um, so what we focusing is on one of the special programs is the biomedical imaging collections and analysis. So that's one of the focusing of this whole project. And the working packages five is working on this focus. Um, so currently that the one we are doing is, um, um, it's the training part, but we see the training is actually utilizing for all of this, um, the imaging, uh, the data collection, the imaging uh, processing, and then the CVL platform, all of this information. And I was just trying to um, let the, um, the, the, the neural imaging community to be more aware of all of that and then to uh, take advantage. And then as Catherine said, it's free and easy to write on. And there were so many uh, advantages that can help to uh, boost your research. Um, a, a highly summarized for this for the CVL. Um, so one of the things I want to highlight. So Catherine is already covering most of the things. We got three sides. One of the most important thing I will highlight is the power. So I highlight the five thousand sixty five six five thousand. 600 calls. I think this probably, I'm not quite sure this is the old one or probably now it's even more. So this is what I'm talking about to the working notes behind it. So say if you have one day you have UK Bell Bank data, you've got 40,000, you get the maximum ones and you want to run something. If you got 5,000 calls, you actually think each course just run 10 times and you get everything processed. So I guess when you come into the large sample, you, you, you just need this uh, big amount of the computing powers behind you. And another thing that Catherine already highlighted is the most of the imaging tools are pre-installed. I think we, if we, um, we say we can't install it, but it's not a bad thing. So I mean, there will be the professional IT guys behind it to get all of the software installed. You have no idea how difficult it is to some of the software is, it's really difficult. And also very important is um, they're, they, they, they're available on multiple uh, versions So say, if today you want to replicate your PhD work maybe five years ago, and you want to use a very special versions of FSL or FreeSurfer, we all know that the versions may have a little bit impact on the output. So you can still just pull out the old versions and rerun your analysis. Um, at the meantime, if you want to test on the new version, there's so many versions, just by one comment away, then everything will be loaded. Yeah, so that's definitely a, um, a, a, an advantage. Yeah, 
Um, yeah. So just drawing our attention. So I, I, I think I talked about that before. So we have all of these working nodes. So visual nodes is one thing you can run it on, the, on your desk, on your virtual desktop. But the working nodes, it is behind it. So have a lot of potentials in there. And that's today we're gonna to focus on how do we recruit that part of the, the, the nodes that's actually working for us. Um, now let's talk about imaging. I'll be really quick. So this is MRI um, for those people who know. So you get a lot of image that you can generate different modality. You can get T1, you can get DTI, you can function MRI, you can get spectroscopy, so all of that. So today we're just only focusing on the structures, especially the T1 related to so all of those pipelines, um, because we want to run some basic levels analysis. They all just build out the T1 related. Here's a little bit of physics behind it, but there's nothing for you to really uh, important to remember. But if you can thinking of the curves here is a different called the T1 relaxometry. So you can just think in that, that way if this MRI is new to you. So we're basically talking about three body tissues in the brain, so gray matter, white matter, and CSF, and they all have a different T1 relaxometries that because of several reasons. And that differences will become the contrast and then the intensity so later on there. You can see it have a different contrast. And then that is why you see brighter one is, is a white matter, and then the gray one is gray matter, and the dark one is CSF. So how is, that's how we come up. Uh, another important thing is, so uh, usually we're collecting uh, one millimeter um, uh, resolutions for most of the research project. I mean, if, if you want to go advantage, they have, uh, if you have a 70 scanner, you can go really high resolutions. Uh, that's, a, that's a slightly different story, but in here, we're just talking about some basic T1 uh, one millimeter um, resolution uh, imagings. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to the um, the pipelines. Um, so, so if we, if we take a bit, so the first one we're going to talk about is the free surfer. If we take a little bit closer of the brain, so you see the gray matter Y minus CSF, and also importantly, when they uh, they went next to each other, you will see the boundary. So free surfer is good at detecting those boundaries. So, which is the one outside the gray matter is the power surface and the one between white and gray matter is we call the white matter um, surface. And that is how the free surface is basically working. You can imagine just detecting the boundaries and the mapping within the different vertices, ver vertex, vertices, um, and then to check the, uh, the, the cortical thickness behind uh, between it. All right, so it's a complicated process. So this is what I just gonna show. So you here, maybe look at the picture here. So once I get a brain feed in and you go to several process, step by step, step by step, and then, then you get the steps, okay. Um, and then when you run it, you just can reckon all and then, and then with the option to have an all that you can actually get everything run, working. So I put in this slide just here, just to tell you um, two things, firstly, there'll be somewhere that you can stop. So you can say, I only run at a certain uh, stage and we can do some adding some control and they'll call the manual editing. So for, lot, for some of students maybe knows that's the, one of their first tasks in their owner uh, projects or PhD project is the manual editing for free server. So that is how things work. Um, and also um, for next Thursdays, particularly when we're doing it, we have the options in minus auto reckon one. So, we only do the top, I think I remember the first five or six uh, steps because we want to save time. If we want to run everything, it takes uh, a decent like 10 hours. Uh, but if you're on the top five, it's 20 minutes. So we just want to get things running. Um, yep. Okay, so from now on, all of this is just a, a, re a view of what is going to happen on Thursday. So that's the intro. Now we're just talking about the previews of what can happen on Thursday. So again, so all of the materials are being prepared. And then the, I'll, I have a plain text files which have been step-by-step step, all of the tasks that we can do. So I'll be provided in all of this um, uh, syntax. You can just copy and paste it into any of the, um, the terminals and you will get all of the tasks that's been done. Uh, say for example, this one, we just want to call free, uh, free views and then to, um, to view one of the, the output that I put in. 
So that's what this looks like. So I put some example output for free surfer for this particular task. Um, as you can see, I'm not doing really good on the comments. I will keep finishing all of the comments and I just try to explain line by line, especially for the new uh, users. So you will get understanding what does this mean? So I, yeah, on that day, once you put that in, you're supposed to have to see this uh, free views a bit opens and you can play with it. Um, they're just showing one of the, um, the, the output, what this looks like. Okay. Now, the, after this one, we're going to talk about how do we run as individual. So if we get a particularly uh, participants and how do we run? So usually to run free surface, everything is in Reconal. So if you type in Reconal in the terminal, you got all of this long list that basically that give you all of these information that you should understand. Now, how do you actually submit the, how do you run the job with the free surf, uh, using free surface? What's the input, output, all of the options? As you can see, I mentioned that before the auto reckon one is for setting stage one to five only. So that takes about 20 minutes. And you actually, you can do everything else. Um, There's all of this information. And also the uh, free server wikis get all of this very useful uh, information that you need. So again, this we're focusing on how this is run. Uh, we're not to teach you what's a free server. It is a step-by-step. -step. So, but I'll give you this resource. If you're interested, go through that. And you have further questions, you can always shoot emails to myself or ask your supervisors what is the um, anything that you're not sure. Okay, so uh, as I said, I will see in the in the big script, I also have uh, part of the sessions. Say, for example, how to run free surface individually. Um, this is how this is running. Um, so this is the first time I show you this one. I just give a little bit. Um, uh, comments is here. First, you see the hashtag in in Linux in the plain text file. That's a comment. So that's basically those information are not read for the computer. It's read for human like you. You read it what what it is, and then the computer is gonna skip it. Uh, especially the task is gonna um, so it may not read it. So the first useful line is from here. Module load free surfer. So to run that, to type in that in the terminal and press enter, you load free surfer from from the background into your terminal. So it's feel like you have a shelf of all of the tools in your garage, and then you're working on a, on a table in the working station. And before that, there's nothing on your workstation. You can't do anything. But if you want anything, you just quickly grab your tools from the shelf and start working on it. So once you finish, you can easily swap it or grab another one. So you don't need to worry about how to put things in there. That's already pre-installed. So again, that's what I say, that's the advantages. You just quickly switch around the different tools you want and a different version of it. And you can have a multiple version together. Yeah, that's all good. Um, yeah, and then export name into chat. So on that day, we're gonna teach a little bit about the variable. So basically what they're doing is assign a variables from right side to the left side, which is the first time I explain to you. And then they defined subjects DIR, which is a very impo important environment um, variable you need for free surface, which is defined where's the file, where is the input. And you got an input file and you use a little tricks to get rid of the extension names and leave the, 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 uh, um, the actual file name. Because if you're looking at the actually, the only one line is it's running, it's written all, and this input is where's the file, where's the file and what's the file name, with the full name and then minus s is a subject. So, so basically that is indicating they will create a new folder for all the output and the output name is the file name without a dot in it. As you can, that doesn't make sense because the file is a folder. You don't want a file name, it's a folder. Um, so that's why we have to ex exclude it at the extension name. And then auto recon also give you like an option to just run a short version. And it's, it will run. So on that day, it should be like that. If it's not, we're going to fix it on that day. Uh, and also we do the timing. So I'm probably not to do it on Thursday, but usually that's one of the reasons I have to run it individually because I need the time because that will be one of the very important res the, the, the resource I will define when I'm running things parallelly. Um, yeah, so next time we go to how do we run it parallelly? Okay. So um, as I said, that we have we need the task to define the resource environment and common. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So 
the, there will be a script folders. So if you remember the folder structures in the free surface, we have an output example and another one we've got a free surface underscore slums. So in here, we'll have a folder called scripts. And once you open it, you will have, um, there are three, there's only three, three files that you need to be understand. And then once you understand that, there's basically no uh, questions when you're running anything off slums. Yeah. So I will firstly start this, the easiest one. I start with the easy one. So submit templates is .sh means there's a file, something that they can run, um, they can executable. So if you open this file, it's just a couple of lines. So basically the first one hashtag is in, just indicating this is a bash script. And then after there's only just one for loop and the for loop is, so, so for the for loop, we need to understand the first line is for i in cat list.txt. So here we have another file that's been calling it's list.txt. So once we open that, you will know it just one, two, three, four, the four input files that's here in the input folder. So simple as that, that's just the input, um, the file name. And that's probably what's going to be your uh, PhD work like. Imagine that you download lots of data and and then one by one, they name them similarly, but it's quite different by the subject ID. So that roughly will be what this looks like. Um, and then cat means extracting them one by one. Um, and then this is single quote things is just very unique. So you have to remember once you do run similar, make sure you have that little things. Um, and then the I is a variable. The a variable will be signed for the first item, so the first uh, file name, and then second step file name, third, and fourth, they'll be signed four times. And within each, each time, it will run all of the things between do and done. So which means these two lines will be run four times. With the I, it's a changing the content within I from one, two, three, four, okay? So that is actually the easiest way that you can thinking of. I run a script a couple of times and each time the input is different. The input is the input file name. So that is a very, a uh, simple way that you can thinking of how you parallel something. Yeah, so you don't need to run it with that. The computer is, is lo looping it for you. And then we're looking at what is this two line is actually doing. The first line is quite e easy. It's export uh, files equal to dollar I. I probably uh, have an idea why you need to do this. So basically the export is to define a global variable. So the a new variable name is called a file will taking the content of I and then sign it to it. So, and then the files will keep having that content with it, no matter how many script you run within this terminal, they always, the file is always the first input file name. Okay. I just speak a little bit more because this is the first one. And after that, the later one, it will be very similar like that. And the last thing is it doing S batch of uh, a file. So S batch is you submit this job to the slurm system. Yep, it's not the bash. If you bash it, you're gonna run it straight away in this terminal. So S-batch is you give it to the slurm. You think of the managers to get this ticket saying, okay, I'll, I'll, I got it. I will find someone to run it. I won't run it now, but I will find someone. So if you want to get, tell someone you want to you'd run it later. So you have to tell what you want to run and how many resources you need, who you want this to run and run for how long, et cetera and also the environment you need. So there are three. So although this is the longest script, it's the longest script for you to understand, but this, there's there always is three sessions you want to read. The first time the, the part is completely blue is to define the resource below. So you probably will see, okay, see the hashtag that the computer is gonna skip it. Yes, it, 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 somehow yes. But hash, hash as batch here is actually showing uh, this one, so hash, Hashtag will be skip it for if you run in the um, in the terminal. It's not going to run anything, but S batch will take the information if the hash S batch, right? So the S batch, the slurm manager will looking for standard with the hash S batch, and they will start reading the things behind it. So that's okay. That's a job name equal to child SCS working uh, workstation three as a working shop three. Good. So they take that little information to this job, and then you see the hashtag. And this is for me to, to comment myself. So they don't, they're not reading it. And the hash space aspect. So this, they're not reading this one. So that's the way that I did this line. So they're gonna skip this line, skip this line. 
And then this line makes sense, right? So we want to say, or give it to the worker CPU to run. How many CPUs I need to run this task? One is enough. Perfect. And I can skip all of that so they don't spam emails to me. And then we need this one, memory, right? Just like you're buying a computer, you want to know what's the CPU, how many RAM, um, et cetera. So RAM is important. So according to the manual, four gigs is enough for free server. So we just say four gigs. And then the last, last very important thing is the war time. So how long you need this resource for? Um, it's, um, um, it's a, you, you don't ask it too short and otherwise your job is, run, is running over the time they're gonna to stop it. It's basically like they pull out the power chart, the power for your desktop, bang, stop it. Or, but you don't want to do asking too long because the Slurm system is very smart. They will managing what's the resource that they have and what you ask. If you're asking for 30 days of a job, you probably will take them quite a long time to to get it, but if you ask for 30 seconds, or sorry, 30 seconds too short, 30 minutes, you're very likely to get it straight away. If it's 30 hours, you probably have to wait a couple of hours. So just be smart sometimes when you're trying to stop the job. Okay, so that's everything. Is it easy to understand? That's just something that concrete you need. And very importantly, those are things, usually if you have a script, you know, you'll have the script that I gave you, and you can just keep it like that, and you just just varying it. Um, and if you want some task is dramatically different, then you need a GPU or something. Um, you can shoot emails to me or ask uh, the, the, the CBL teams in your notes. They're very, very uh, uh, helpful in terms of how to help you to set up all of these parameters. Okay, so next one is setup environment. Like we, we said before, we will need to get those tools down into your workstation to start with. So for this sample, this time we need free stuff. Let's get it free stuff. Though and define a couple of variables to point you to where is the file it is. And that everything is here. And then the last thing is basically exactly the same as we run individually. So extract the files and then reckon all, just one line. The so slightly different is the file here, the dollar file is not defined in this task. Again, when you run this, when you run this script, it's this calling from the submit. Tem uh, submit template this file. And when you run this file, the, the again, the file is actually containing the different uh, input file name. And that is how um, this, this script will run a couple of times and with this variable changing. Okay, so once you've done that, done that you just simply navigate to the folder has all of the scripts because I've already done that. And then just bash and then run this um, submit that place. And then you will get, oh, sorry, here, you'll get a notifications, submitting bash jobs, and you'll get a job ID. And that will do job to the, give to the, 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 slur, the job manager. And really depends on the mood of the job manager, so whether they want to get it run or not run. So like the example that the PD is pending, we sometimes we wait a long time, uh, but you can use, there's a few very um, helpful ways that we can check on that day, we're gonna to play with it and see how to check all of your jobs. How does it work? Um, there's some of the tricks as well. Okay. Um, I just see this, uh, it's a two o'clock. So I just wonder, um, do we have any question at the moment? Um, if it's not, I'm putting, oops. I'll put a little quiz. I'll put a little quiz. It's basically um, asking the feedback. I just put it into the chat. It's the feedback uh, for for my workshop. So I, I I'm thinking maybe we can take uh, five minutes rest for everyone. So if you get time, you can um, um, checking this um, the, the the Google form and submit some comments or any questions you can um, just type in the Q&A or just um, in the chat or just talk to me. Uh, I think we'd be back in five minutes. So maybe uh, so eight, eight past two and we'll come back. So I believe all of the other things will probably finish in, in about within a half an hour. question.
I know some of the some of the participants are, are joining next door. So yeah, if you get a question, you can welcome to come in and we can have a discussion. So um, I'd probably also an, another thing I want to say is um, on Thursday, it's really good opportunity if you haven't used CDL before, um, just to get understanding. Um, and you can bring your data in um, and you can play with it. Um, I got a question from Mahu and Charles. I have a question about running jobs in Hera. How is it guys? This is a file that you can waste of main and resource all the time. And the way was just like a of course. Yes, Harry. Yep. Is it different from those two apps? Should I? Yeah, so to answer your questions, actually, there are just I, I personally not using um, Ari Bash a lot before because all of my job is not going to really big numbers of the repeats. So it sometimes works. Um, the Aries, um, one of the things I would imagine is how do you manage the uh, uh, the user if you get some missing data? I'm not quite sure, say, if, you, if you're participants. Uh, Subject one, two, three, four, all the way to 100, but you're missing 53. Whether the Aries can pick that up, um, and I'm not sure. And another thing is if you submit an Ari job and the one job, so you actually just get a one job. So the Ari is like the, the sub job of one job. It's a little bit tricky. So if you have one, if you have one job and attach 100 sub job, how do you queue one of the sub job? I'm not quite sure. Um, and also the weights of all of the sub job is all dependent on one job. So you basically submit one job, but this one job have uh, 100 sub, uh, small jobs. Uh, but a little bit selfish, if you set up, if you submit a 100 jobs parallel, they all, as a job, they all have their job ID. Um, I would thinking that's probably um, getting a little bit higher priorities to run your job. That's my understanding. I haven't tested it yet. I know if you are working with some of the fMRI, uh, resting state function MRI uh, pipelines, they programmed in the um, array job ways. Um, it's, it looks quite neat, quite neat when you are um, looking into the, the script. So probably one script can do um, everything, uh, but it just my my way is it was as probably good to give it to um, uh, for the beginners. So if you have a few files that separate and you know what file each file is doing, how do they talk with each other? Each other and probably it's the easy way that you can um, uh, manage it and to change it. Yeah, but definitely it's a good idea. It's an area batch ID. Yeah. Hope that I understand you, uh, answer your question. Oh, yeah, good point, Chong. Um, I think if that is the case, if you have a lot of small jobs, if you get a thousand, ten thousand small jobs, I think you can negotiate with massive team, uh, at least for M3, thinking whether, say, whether they have some good ideas to help you out on that, maybe increase the limits of the job that you can have, I think. And secondly, yeah, we, we have the similar things as you have to set up a little uh, logic in your script once you finish the first batch and then they release the second batch, um, et cetera. And I think, uh, uh, what's his, Ben, ben, ben Foucher did, uh, um, he was, he was uh, I had that problem before and he, um, I, I remember he had something to um, run that. And also um, I think someone who is now working in the UK Bell Bank probably have the similar things um, yeah you, if you if you need uh, you can chat with me and we can um, figure out how to help you
Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's keep going. Um, so the next two, the second, the second top lines we're going to talk talk about is um, the FSO first. So as again, the FSO is a huge, it's a very very popular toolbox. It can do everything basically. You can see here. Oops. Uh, function MR structure, DTI, GOM, others. So they, they, this is um, this is really great tools. Uh, but today we can only focusing is the, the FL first. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, this one is showing you. Um, I'm not again. I'm not gonna teach you FSL. Um, it's just so many things, and they also have really really good online course. I remember um, there's some of the really nice uh, videos online, and they probably have the FSL YouTube channel now. They have. Um, more content than before. Um, so it's really good if you go through one of the uh, courseworks online, you're going to get uh, most of the, the, the functions. Um, but FSO first is really looking into the subcortical region. So remember, we're just talking about those boundary between gray matter and white matters, and you can measure the white matter, the, the, the cortical regions. But you actually can, can see this the gray matter is actually, there's some subcortical regions like this one is the putamen um, and then chordate. Um, so you can see that's the gray matter, but it's, uh, it's actually surrounded by white matter. And that's the FSI how it works. It's gonna pick up those regions and then map it out and then create the surface of it. Uh, and also I'll, I'll forget to say that in free surface as well. So FSL on the free, FSL first and free surface is very, very popular. So they used it for so many studies. They probably will see lots of studies using it. And they're just showing that in the Enigma, um, the big data consortium, they use um, the standard FSL and free software ways to, um, um, to process the data. If you're interested, you can have a look. They're slightly different than the one that we processed uh, uh, with the script that I provided. Um, this is basically showing the how they're doing it. So again, they're just detecting the intensity of their changes between the um, um, the boundary between gray matter and white matter, a plus of where it is located. So and then all of this, they estimated the boundaries of different subcortical regions, and then the, and then they just um, uh, map it out, detour it, and then separate it out, and then calculate it and calculate the volume. So here's just showing on that day, I'm gonna show you these folders with all of the output looks like. It's lots of small files rather than compare with the free service, a couple of folders and subfolders. Here's all of the files are dumped together. This is, they have a really good naming system. At least this is which input file it is and then what is the region it is. The, T, the, the VTK file is actually the, uh, uh, you can see the surface file is indicating all of the different regions, what this looks like. So it will be like that. Um, there are 15 different regions, you can then left and the right. And then the most important is this file we're gonna have a visit is the mask of the output, which is end up with the first, first second. Yeah, and then this next task we're gonna to do, the first time we're gonna do is to visualize the output, right? So again, module load FSL and then define the input and then just run FSL eyes. And then you know, if you just type in this and copy and paste into terminal, you will get um, FSIs, which is the popular uh, visualization tools within uh, uh, the FSL. And you see, this is the brain looks like and all of the different regions, subfield segmentation has been, uh, has been done and you see the different regions in here. Yeah, we can play with it on that Thursday and we're just pointing around. Um, the next one is how do we write individually? Um, again, so we need a timing, right? So how long is it gonna take? Uh, fortunately, it takes 20 minutes, which is great. Um, and then it's a very similar as the one before the how to run free surfer, load FSL and then point it to which folder it is, point it to the input file because we only want to run one file. So we'll just point it to the input file. Yeah, it, it's this pair to file. And then just one line, uh, run FSL, input, output, much piece of verbal. They will print everything on there. So I think probably now you already get the idea. So that is how the things work. So um, you got comment, input, output, other options, 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 options. One line, basically you can do everything. Okay, so it's very simple. So I'm not spending too much time on there. And then we quickly go into parallel on uh, using slums for FSL first. 
it's exactly, oh, so not exactly, but very, very similar. Again, I got the script folders in here, the FSL first and FSL um, folders in here. And uh, together you will see you have the input files, the testing files there as well. But open this scripts folders. We'll have all of, again, three folders, uh, three files. The first file is a submit file. Very, very similar as before. Uh, the for loop, and then I read this, the, um, the input file. So here I made a little bit tricky is I remove the .nni itself before I, uh, you know, a little bit cheating, so, but yeah, you can do that. Um, alternative, you use the, the remove extend that little tricks to remove them. Um, and then everything is the same. You pass that variables to files and then you, you run subscript. I have this line is echo. Echo basically means print everything's behind it. So basically just add in a little bit information to myself. So I'm saying I'm submitting or drop this one, this file, just give a little bit of feedback to myself. So you can remove it if you don't need. Uh, and then the S batch is running again. There's a there's a, a task file that is I'm going to use that to talk to the slurp, the, the job manager. Again, three sessions, resource it's here is basically the same. And I know I can save 10 minutes. I just change it from 30 to 20. And then the variable, uh, the environment is the same. So load FSL and then point it out where the, DR, the directory it is. And then the comments is exactly the same as you run it individually. Simple as that. To get it running, what you need to do, I have to get a, how to have, get how to running. So also, also in this a huge, um, um, the script that I'm gonna give you is here how to run it. So you basically define your uh, uh, the, the the path and change direct to the script folders and just simply bash and run it. And once you run it, you will see all of the uh, the job is submitted. You can use the uh, SQ to check it, and soon you will have the file once the job is run. Okay. So this is the way we're gonna to play with it on Thursday. Okay. Quickly, we're gonna to move to the next one is, the last one is a little dif different. Um, it's the, uh, the Malab-based task. So here we pick up another very famous and then popular uh, toolbox is SPM. It's for statistical parametric mapping, no, SPM. Um, again, so it's, it's a very enriched in, in terms of all of the documentation. If you go to the course, and you will navigate to there's online videos that also will give you all of the information that you need. Again, I'm not teaching this, um, but it's, if you're interested, you can always go through that. Any question, I'm happy to help you out. Um, the one that we're gonna focus today is a very a kind of special, but I think it's a typical for, for us to, 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 to know because this is um, extensions of SVM. And SVM itself has a lot of functions already but they also have so many extensions. They're all kind of very, very, um, uh, very helpful. And then they based on SPM. Uh, one of the famous one is the CAT. Um, it's computational anatomic toolbox. Before prior, that is just called themselves VBM8 or VBM. It's one of the popular things that you do the VBM, sorry. VBM is for voxel-based morphometry. So that's in contrast with the surface space, which we'll talk about the free surfer. Remember that we pick up the points that's already, that's actually mapping in the surface. However, however the voxel base is keep everything in the 3D space. So we're always talking about a voxel, this 3D space. So for all of each voxels, what do you pre-represent it? What is your gray matter? What's the white matter? Um, so very briefly, um, so VBM, so again, VBM is, is a way you process the data, but they, they, they also become, a, <laughs> Before that, they become the tool's name. So now the cat, they're doing VBM and the other things can do VBM. So they have FSL can do VBM. Uh, I think FreeSurfer can do some, some voxel based and I'm not quite sure, but yeah, the VBM. So, but no matter what you do, the VBM is very similar. Oops. So uh, basically you got an image and you get rid of the scalp. And then the most important thing is basically first to segment the gray matter and the white matter. Um, it's, it's also the intensity dependent and also the spatial dependence. So where is this, this box? So it's, it's located in the brain, which part is so more likely to bring matter or white matter. Um, and then the next step is normalize. So make sure that everyone's brains 
after segment can compare with the other's brain. You need to bring that brain, bring that brain into the same space and then stretching and then around to make sure they all lined up properly. So when I talk about a one box of a person A, it's the same place for person B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Okay, so that's, that's coming into the two main thing, tasks you need to do for VBM pre-processing pre pipeline. And the last one is a smooth to increase some uh, signal noise ratio. Um, so the one we particularly pick up is the longitudinal pipelines. Um, not only because of, uh, uh, it's just, we're just currently working on something like that. So I just pick up this one as I'm working on it. Um, it's, this is a very dry way that how they, these things is working. Uh, but for longitudinal, maybe you like, so here I make a little um, animation is you have, a, you scan the same persons before and after we call the baseline and follow up. So the first thing is, you try to jiggle around to match these two together, and then you average these two, you get a mean. And then you jiggle to the baseline to this mean, and then get the, the baseline corrected into this mean position and do the same thing for the follow-up. And then while these two files in the, that space, you segment it. So the segmentation stay in the same space as this T1, yeah. And because we're saying we want, still want it to be, everyone should be in the same, um, the, the, the space. So we need one more thing called the normalizations. So the normalization or the nonlinear um, registrations was happening from the mean all the way to the standard space. So it roughly it's going this way, this nonlinear. And then you will kind of to record it. How did they do to matching this mean to the standard space? And then, will believe because this is a mean. So as I'm not biased with either baseline or follow-up. So uh, what I'm doing from this one to the standard space is balanced in terms of the impact of this time point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply this, um, all of them, the operation that you did, the, everything that you did from here to here, all of this will be applied on, on the, the, the um, the gray matter map, and you get a final gray matter map. And you get the, the same thing, you're gonna do it in the follow-up, so you get a follow-up. And all of this will later on fit in or into the, the stats. You don't really need to know uh, all of the details, or you can start you, know, you sometimes to, uh, to, to, to go through the details if you're really interested. But to run from here to here, it's just simply like one, one line, one comment to do it. Um, so again, so today is so we mainly focus on how, does, how do we run it? How do we run it parallel for all of the slurm, uh, using slurm? Okay. Um, so again, so the SPM is based on MATLAB, right? So this is how we call MATLAB in uh, CVL. Uh, MATLAB is popular, so for engineering related research, it is, so I, uh, yeah, I can't more than emphasize it. So that's how it's running. And the interesting thing you can see is I can load it a very special SPM with a special MATLAB version with a special uh, SPM uh, updates. So we got a lot of options here. And if you're interested in a certain one, you can, for sure you can install it yourself. So you can just add parts yourself later or you can ask message to install. So I pick up this version because it's um, less bugs. Um, again, you have all of, you go into the path where is, I put all of the, 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 the process, the file there and you run MATLAB and MATLAB will start. And in the MATLAB, you have the command window. So for those who don't know MATLAB, so there's a command window, you can keep typing all of the command and to let the, uh, the, the MATLAB response. You type in SPM and these things will come up. So I just want to draw attention. So I put a little comments actually in the script. So this is actually bring up all of the ideas out of how to run MATLAB. Palace is very fundamental is if you have MATLAB and the minus R, and then we see some other comment. The, the comment you're gonna type into uh, the comment window. The MATLAB will actually run it. Once the MATLAB is turned on, it's gonna run this comment. So keep in mind, this line when we run is in what is in bash script. So this is what we actually always want to see. So if you want to run something non-bashed, so you want to try to see how do I actually in the bash script to call the program and then run the programs in in a couple of so one lines um, in the script, uh, in the in the bash in the in the bash script or in the terminal. Okay, I will come back to that later. So if we 
keep doing this interactive way and we can select the VBM and go to check regions. So this is a four. We can load some of the example files that are already uh, uh, um, loaded in there. Um, and then check Rigio is the SPM versions of view all of the images. Um, it's quite powerful as well. And they have some unique uh, adva um, good uh, advantages compared with the others. Um, but very importantly, you can see the all lined up and the right click and see all of the details. We'll definitely play with it on Thursday, uh, next Thursday. Okay. All right. The, after done that, that's looking to how do we run that longitudinal pipeline individually. So to run that, of course you can. So firstly, let's find out where it is. It's because I said it's extension, it's in toolbox and you go to cat 12. And here is all of the options, uh, all of the functions that cat 12 so cat will provide it. So one of the important is the segment longitudinal data. That is the one that we're looking at. Click the button simply, and you will have this very, very important thing called the batch editor. So, um, the, the batch editor has really become um, very, very uh, powerful since the, I think SPM 8 and SPM 12. So you can, uh, so from here, so you can make things um, uh, parallel and run in, in the script. So you can get rid of all of these uh, buttons and the pointings. So basically what happened is you have all of the modules on here, but today we only have one module, okay? And all of the parameters is actually in here. So you can the data, et cetera. So, you can click buttons and then to do one case. So you can just do one particular person. Say for example, here I select subject 07. We'll do, we'll do that on Thursday. And then the data will be loaded here and you can just click that green uh, triangles and everything will start running. And instead of that we're running it, what we can do is we can build SPF batch file. What it does it mean is you can say the batch and the script if you click save batch, it will get you a .NET file. But if you do that, you actually get a script. So here's what a script looks like. So, um, so we can have a look. So basically, this is whole script is a define a variable called a MATLAB batch. And all of these are dots. It's just like this, the subfield of this variable. And this variable is taking all of the information that enough for you to run this particularly task. And here is the longitudinal pre-processing uh, uh, a VBM uh, analysis. If you have a couple of more modules, you have MATLAB batch one, two, three, four, all of this all together. Okay, so here we just need a little bit um, edits. I'll have, I'll have the both file, I'll have this file for you in the example file. You probably need to know a little bit of MATLAB. So what you want to need is convert that into a function. So in this one, it doesn't have the, the header and then the end. So it just a script. All of these things will be run one by one. But if we have a function VBM 12 underscore slum and I save this file as the same name and the VBM 12 underscore slum dot M, so they become a function. And in the function, what is important is I can, input, I can, I can uh, let it carry input from the function. So for example, in here, all of the input is pre-saved in this file. But in here, I don't need it. So the percentage here, you can make sense everything green is comment is out. So you can see the original input file is commented out. It's not reading by the computer anymore. Instead, the input part here is become a variable called a BL, which is I'm listening to it. It will feed it to it. And the follow-up is the follow-up image file and it's in here, it will be feeding. Once I get the file names in there, it will be exactly the same as what they hear before and then they can run it. And another thing is we're adding a SPM job man to run the task. And the task I mean is this variable, the MATLAB batch variable. So I just say call SPM, let it running. And then now, so this one just get all of the environment set up. And the next one is just simply running. Okay, so just to draw your attention of that, remember we can use MATLAB to minus R of function. So the functions that can be this a functions here or a script or a comment, whatever the way you talk. So the ultimate goal is to make it possible to run in bash script. So here it is. We have this one in the, in the script that I'm gonna share with you on Thursday. That's going backwards here. 
So the core part of this is MATLAB dash no display because I'm going to run it in a working node which doesn't have display. So we can have that one. So to stop the complaining and use more resource. And then minus R is to run a few comments behind it. So firstly, we do CD change directory to where it is. And then so see, remember this file is actually the function we define and we saved as a, a file that can be run for MATLAB as a function. And now the, the BL and the FU is kind of uh, represented to the baseline and the follow-up file. And for these files, we can look into the, 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 the dollar ID. So the ID variable is here. The ID is simply the input file names for baseline. And then the FID is simply the file names for the, uh, the follow-up. So I did a little bit trick here and then to extract it just to convert from the here to here. Well, we can go into details on Thursday. Um, what we're going up in here, they just basically to define the DIR here. So where is the, uh, the file? And also where is the script? So because I need to go into that script folder and to run this script, otherwise they'll complain, they can't find it. Okay, so once I just copy paste all of that into one of the terminal and run, you will see it's running and you see the MATLAB is um, and it will start running it. Yeah. So finally, it's that's how to using it to run it parallel. So again, you've got a script folders in here. And in here, um, we got a script. That's all of the scripts I'm going to share with you guys on that day. So it's in SPM VBM and SPM VBM Slurm. And together, we have some of the image that we can play with it. Um, within this folder, instead of three files, we have four files because remember we have that the, the MATLAB files we need to run. Again, so let's just start with the submit. It's reading the input uh, folders, the input files, and then um, run the QSAP in the loop way. And if you look at the task here, it's also three parts. You find the, the the resource, that's what we need. It's a little bit longer time, so I need five hours here. And then here is all of the information that you need to predefine. And exactly the same as we run the individual. So we just exactly the lines here. And what's the difference is that file, the file, uh, where is it? Yeah. yeah, the ID is a changing. So I change it from file to ID, but it's exactly the same things. It's a varies um, across the different participants. Um, and then that's how it's gonna run. But if you can go in, if you're checking the, uh, the script that wait, um, are prepared and just go into that folders and just bash the submit, then you have all of the job in submitted. And once it's finished, you'll get it. Oh. All right, so that's concluded everything that I prepared. So I just quickly preview it. Um, I hope maybe not today, but by Thursday, if you really go through that, hopefully that's, you'll find uh, the way to process something and you can hopefully inspiring you to do something uh, about your your particular work and if you're interested um, you're welcome to um, uh, to yeah you can ask me questions so uh, similar things I would, you can run for like my prep or whatever all of the, the toolbox it's it's basically working um, okay so last things um, before I finish is the here is the um, workshop. So um, I, I believe you can find everything in the imaging tools website. Uh, here I put a QR code. So if you're interested, you can just take photos and you can register it later. Um, yeah, uh, 1 p.m. on 31st Thursday. Um, any question, you're welcome to email myself or Catherine. Uh, right. Yeah, so that's everything I prepared. Um, uh, let me, any questions, please just um, um, can put it out in the chat. Um, I'll get a question from Judy. So for SPM, is MATLAB licensing already provided on HCP? Yes, 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 yes. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, Every 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 years they um, they will they will renew it themselves in the behind. So 
And then the MATLAB license is the one that's supporting floating computing, which is the cluster computing, so uh, which is all covered. So you don't need to worry about it. Uh, one thing you would probably need to sort it out on that day is, uh, is the, the license for FSL. Um, no, but on that day, I can show you, I can show everyone how to get access to that. Um, you just need to basically pick the box and join the group in the, the portals and it'll be fine. Yeah. Cool. Um, any more questions before we... I'm just thinking, um, um, oh, so yeah, kind of it's only myself. So if that's, it's all good. So thanks for everyone, um, conclude this workshop. So another thing um, before we're going is on in May, there will be a, a different work, workshops that are working on, um, ah, yes, um, short mark, um, yes, that, so sorry, before that, uh, on, on, in, in May, there will be a different as a machine learning on, on your imaging. There will be uh, speakers from um, Monash, um, Sydney Uni, um, I think Melbourne Uni, um, the people who always be more traditional and academic way. And uh, I will add in a little bit hands-on sessions, um, um, at least smaller sections towards the finishing part. Um, so keep in mind, uh, keep in the eye on this on the, uh, the same website, and then we're gonna to uh, circulate it within um, OHBM. Yeah. So Mark's question. So uh, I see Catherine will send an emails to everyone. So I am basically going to share the the the, the slides and then the scripts, all of the scripts into um, the same place that we share for all of the other talks, um, and in the scripts. Um, probably we'll also have a GitHub, we're, we're gonna share that. Um, if you are on uh, a massive, you're very welcome to uh, join that and then and then you can just copy the script away. Um, if it's not, we definitely, everything will be online um, and it will be open. If you need it urgently, Mark, just email me and can, I can forward that to you. Right. Um, if that's all good, we're going to conclude today's workshop. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. Um, hope you have a good afternoon. <laughs>